all of the packet data that we're actually able to see, all the encrypted data. Now typically, depending on the size of the network, how much activity is going on in the network, it could take anywhere from 10 minutes to a couple of hours. And again, this is the passive form of the attack. We're not forcing any activity to occur. We're passively monitoring. Now, obviously, we're not going to sit here for a couple of hours and wait for this to happen. So how, how do you know you have enough uh, data points? Um, there's no determinant factor to know that you have enough data points. Basically, what you have to do is typically let it run. Um, my preference is to let it run for an hour to three hours. And usually within that time frame, I'll have enough data gathered where I can decrypt those uh, web access keys. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over and show you a demonstration of a file that I've already saved. Okay, here what I'm passing to it is AirCrack is the counterpoint tool to the monitoring tool. AirCrack will take the data that we've saved in a file of all the encrypted data and will go through that encrypted data and attempt to identify the key for us so that we can then join that web encrypted network. This file here that I'm about to feed AirCrack is called War on Terra. That's the name of my access point at home that I use. And before we decrypt that, I'm going to show you a screenshot of it. As you can see, this is a Linksys access point router. 54G. I'm using a 64-bit web encryption 10 hex digit key. My key one is 25592F6E4A. Now if we go back and we have the aircraft tool execute against that capture file where it captured the wireless encrypted packets on my home network, it's going to run. It's reading the packets. And it's going to say, because of all that data, remember earlier we saw several networks and we were capturing all the data. So now AirCrack says, I've identified eight different networks in here. Which one do you want to target? We're going to target number one. So now it's going to go back and it's going to dump all the information for the rest. And it took it approximately probably around seven seconds to decrypt that and identify the key on my 64-bit encrypted web network. Key found, 255926E4A. We go back to the screenshot. You'll see that that key it identified matches key number one for my web encrypted network. Now, 128-bit networks will take a little longer. They might take as long as 30 to 40 seconds to decrypt after you've captured the packets. So, question for you. Mm -hmm. So right now, if you go in and try to test this one, mm -hmm. let's give it five minutes. And we go and see if there's enough data. I mean, how would you know? I know you said that you can put an hour, so but is there like a, a place where say if I have a thousand packets or whatever packets it is, it's sufficient enough for me to go and encrypt? Is there, is there anything like that? Um, I mean, there's not a definite, there's no definitive formula that can tell you that once you have X number of packets, you've got enough. Because the packets vary so much that you can't say for sure. Now, my experience on hacking web networks is that typically if I have at least 200,000 packets, I've got a good chance of breaking the web network. Right. To be on the safe side, if you have half a million packets, you're going to break the web network every time. 64-bit, 128-bit, they can change their keys every 20 seconds. It doesn't matter. Once you get up to the half a million packet range, you have more than enough data to break anyone's web network. Now, again, to, to sum up, what we focused on here was how to hack a web network passively. You can also do what's called injection attacks I mentioned earlier. The problem with injection attacks is if they have a security system active and they're monitoring, like Cisco Security can find some of this stuff, they will see where someone is attempting to inject packets into their network and do max spoofing. And at that point, uh, whoever is monitoring is going to know that there's somebody in radio range that's attempting to hack into their network. So that exposes you to being caught. I noticed something here. 
when you were scanning the network, there was certain network that was showing that were not here because my machine was connected to them earlier on and they were broadcasting. Okay, let me bring that uh, screen back up. Was that downstairs or was that here? No, in my laptop, because some of it's going to show is my home network at the bottom, okay? And it shows that I, I, I identified it because my laptop is broadcasting. Oh, it has, it has a wireless connection. So it's always trying to connect to something. So I found some of the, my home network showed up, like that Holiday Inn. That Holiday Inn was because I connected to Holiday Inn when I was in California. Then it's gonna show you my home network. It's gonna show up there. So it was interesting to see. No, no, the individual showed up. Okay, Who's Northside? <laughs> okay, Northside. What this is over here so yours? <laughs> is a broadcast, yeah? Yeah, this is a broadcast. And what happens is when people travel, like I mean, Charlie, you know, you're on the road traveling, you're at an airport or a hotel. Your system remembers the last, you know, let's say the last five or ten networks you've connected to. So as soon as you turn your laptop on, it's going to try to find, it's going to send out beacons and say, do I see any of these access points? Now, while that doesn't present a technical security risk, what that does allow someone to do is to notice that, for example, Somebody must have been at the Holiday Inn recently. Exactly. And since that's the first in the list, there must be somebody from the Holiday Inn nearby that was recently connected. What I've seen in doing security tests is that, particularly with people from like IBM or Microsoft, you can literally see their travel patterns. You can see them where their headquarters office is, and you'll see them at a hotel like uh, Peachtree Atlanta or Atlanta Peachtree and you can actually deduce what their travel patterns are based upon what access points are showing up. So that's just kind of an interesting side thing. There's no technical... I wonder why mine's not showing up as far as... Uh... Are you going to do wireless this right now? Yeah. Once you're connected, you're connected. It doesn't do wireless. Uh, okay. Well, mine is not connected to anything. That's it. So it's still it. broadcasting yeah, trying yeah, to figure yeah, out yeah. what it is. Yeah, because mine's got to be one of the ones that's connected to SDF. Exactly. Exactly. So, like anything else, this, this is interesting. Yeah, it is. Very cool. Does anyone have any other questions or? No, no. Not a like, good job. Right now, we need to go and test this no network. <laughs> <laughs> or a small fee, I'll test it for you. <laughs> um, I appreciate you guys coming, and um, I hope good. I hope this will leave you with a better understanding of web networks so and how to track is, web networks. The question networks. is, is okay, how do you protect from getting cracked? That's the question. The easiest way? Uh -huh. Change the WAF. Don't use wireless. No. Um. <laughs> no, no. Exactly. Okay. So the is, what's the best way to do? Change the WAP. Okay. Um, Here's Jason right here. Hey, man. Thank you very much. This is WPA, right? Um, upstairs with it, huh? You said it right here. Oh, yeah. Do I have a video from two? Oh, no. Nah. So you can stop right now? Yeah.